we'll uh, we'll get going um, and let other people just join in. They can watch the beginning on the YouTube. I know for a fact that we have a lot of um. Oh, I have four people in the waiting room. Yikes! <laughs> Slacking, Jude. Yeah. <laughs> I usually get a little conversation. There we go. I'm sorry to all that I, I didn't get the little uh, notation that people were in the waiting room. Welcome, everyone. Cool. Um, did you did you have anything, Jude, that you wanted? Well, to I was just about? gonna. Um, I I was gonna say. Um, uh, yeah, I wanted to welcome everybody. Um, and I think that this is going to be one of those just like key resources that folks across the country and across the world are going to really appreciate having access to. And I'm so thankful that you were uh, that Mina was able to to make time to put this together um, because uh the when i put out a f I put out a little thing to our community here that said hey what would you like to know more about if as coaches and like everyone was like how do you coach middle schoolers and <laughs> our middle school league is enormous we have just in seattle we have we had about 88 teams signed up um oh, wow. and the fact that so many people were willing to coach without knowing without feeling comfortable doing it uh, is a testament to how important it is to people, but also like what a daunting task it is. So I'm very thankful that you were able to, to, to make time to put this together and share your lessons learned with our community. Um, this is, this is just going to be a great resource going forward. Um, and I also appreciate having gotten to know you through these process, through this process. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we made this connection and uh, yeah. I hope you don't mind if I keep emailing you with questions. No, no, for this. sure. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, Mina, I'll let you introduce yourself and, and All right, cool. what you're doing. Um, so thank, I wanted to thank Jude, first off, for organizing all these, all these um, webinars. They've been really great. Um, and throughout all of them, Strat and I were talking and, you know, she, she noticed that, like, there's been lots of mention about how middle school is different, how crazy middle schools are, et cetera but we haven't yet talked specifically about middle schoolers. So, and I think it's helpful to share those experiences um, so that we can all be a resource for each other. Um, given that I'm not, I'm by no means an authority on, on middle schoolers or middle school ultimate. Um, there's probably plenty of people here who've been coaching um, more than I have. Uh, so I wanna leave plenty of um, space for discussion. Um, feel free to jump in uh, as, as much as you, you'd like and are, are comfortable, uh, whether it be in the chat or, um, or just jumping in on the mic. Um, I really hate just <laughs> talking to a screen. Um, so it would, it would help me out a lot if, if you guys were um, more active. Um, so just a little about, a bit about me. I am a former um, mixed and women's club player um, on teams that are so old that they no longer exist. <laughs> um, so uh, um, ACL injury and um, kids uh, kind of took me off that track. And then when the Grandmasters um, division came around um, is when I started playing again. Um, I've had about 25 years of working with youth in various capacities. Um, only the last two years in coaching. Um, I've mostly been teaching college students, adults, and retirees um, the last 13 to 14 years. Um, so as I mentioned, I've been coaching the last two years, uh, middle school, um, and I've also been doing YCCs in the summer uh, for the under 17 team. So I was an assistant coach for the women, for the girls team last this past summer, and I'm supposed to be the assistant coach for the boys team um, this summer, but we'll see what happens. Um, I've also done some CDP coach facilitating with Strat. Um, so that's kind of my background. Um, how I got into coaching, I think it's kind of, uh, uh, I'll just kind of speak about how I got into coaching. And that's, um, 
I was talking to um, some friends who were talking about their kids in middle school and how um, she had twins, one boy and one girl. The boy was really into it. Um, the girl wanted to play, but there was no female coach around and she didn't feel comfortable um, being around a bunch of boys. So um, that's kind of how I got uh, interested in coaching because um, I felt like there was a need there in the middle school um, level uh, for more female coaches and female role models. Um, and so I just, uh, here we have uh, not only the Washington Area Frisbee Club, but in my town of Arlington, um, which is next to DC, uh, we have the Youth Ultimate League of Arlington. So I kind of just emailed the organizers and jumped right in. Um, I coach uh, um, the, in the Arlington Public Schools in the fall. Um, and then I coach in the Youth Ultimate League of Arlington for the spring and then the YCCs in the summer. Um, so we all know middle schoolers are wonderful, but they present unique challenges. Um, and what, what those challenges are, are gonna be kind of unique to what your coaching context is also. So I'll just kind of tell you, um, well, actually let's, I think, how many people are there, Jude? I can't hear you. Sorry, we have eight, including, we have eight. Okay, so that's good. Let's, um, if, if you guys can go around and um, I think it's, it's useful to hear what everybody's coaching context is, because um, that's really gonna inform like kind of what, uh, what you may or may wanna take away from other people's suggestions, et cetera. Um, so uh, do one of you guys wanna start talking about kind of what your, at, where you've been coaching, you know, how long your season is, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, kind of what is, has been one of the biggest challenges of coaching middle school. I can go first. Um, sure. um, my name is Miriam. I'm in uh, the Boston area. So I coach in the Boston Buddha's uh, youth program. Um, and I keep, we have um, multiple <laughs> sites. I coach in the Lexington site um, and I'm the head coach uh, for the U14 girls team. Um, and I started like four years ago now. This would have been the beginning of my fifth season this spring, but we just called it as of yesterday uh, for our spring season. Um, and um, I started out as the boys U14 coach and I asked why there wasn't a girls team if there was a boys team. Um, and so I started the girls team. Um, so the following spring, um, I, um, took the girls to make a team. And I think my biggest challenge is getting enough girls um, that are in the middle school range. Um, so what I ended up doing, we have a U10, U12 program that's at the same site. And I took the girls that were in that program. There's about 60 boys in the U10, U12 program. And there would be <laughs> one girl in the U10 and one girl in the U12. Um, and I took all of those girls. So for me, the biggest challenge is age. Um, I have people that are 10 and I have girl, and I also have people that are 13. Um, but that gives me just enough to have to run a practice. Um, so I think my biggest challenge is the wide range of ages, not just skill level. So some of the younger ones have better skills than the older ones, but it's the maturity of like what they find humorous, what they don't find humorous and that kind of stuff. They're all really nice, but I think that's my biggest challenge. Uh, I can go next. Um, I'm Amy, and I think Joy's on the call here, too. She and I together coach the um, middle school in Arlington, Mass, right outside Boston. And Miriam, you might have had my daughter, Cece, with you last fall. She's one of the, one of the girls who's very young with very good skills, um, and she has older brothers, so she wants to play with the boys. But... Um, we coach uh, sixth through eighth grade at the Arlington Middle School, which is now two separate schools. So again, the disparate ages, uh, you know, there's a big size difference between a lot of sixth graders and eighth graders, as well as skill level and maturity level and what they find funny and all those things. So being able to deal with kids who just want to horse around with their friends versus kids who really want to learn the game. Um, so one of the things you talked about in the, what we'll, what we'll cover today is dealing with behavior issues and those kids who just wanna screw around are really difficult as far as 
guiding the team um, to really learn and grow in their skills. So keeping it fun is the best way to try to deal with that, I think. Thanks for being here. Yeah, hi, I can add to Amy since I coach with her. Um, we have, um, we've been running our program through our recreation department. So there are no tryouts and no cutting. Uh, so we get a variety of kids. And sometimes I feel like we're babysitting that parents want their child to do a sport. Um, and ultimate seems like the least of all the other evils in terms of um, what we offer. So um, it's, it's hard to know and gauge whether the players who show up each week really want to be there or whether their parents are making them come. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, we have amazing players because they're either second generation players or they're um, really athletically inclined um, and, and trying to make it um, so that they're all learning um, at their own pace and hopefully coming together at the end of the season. So and thanks for doing this. Do you want to pass the baton to somebody else? Um, should I just pick a name from the list? Sure. Uh, what happened here? Hold on, I'm I'm still new at this. <laughs> uh, okay, there we go. How about Deirdre? Because I like your fuzzy bear picture, mm -hmm. but you're muted right now. Uh, I can go. You can. <laughs> oh, okay. Zoom is Zoom is tough if you haven't played around with it for a while. Um, All right. My name is Ming, and I have been um, from the Philadelphia area. I just um, started coaching years ago when PADA, which is the Ultimate Frisbee organization here, started a youth program it was called patio and we went to rec centers in philadelphia and did um these um whoever is in the neighborhood come out and learn how to play frisbee kind of things um then we started doing leagues and um doing more organized things which was you know more sustained um mostly in, I think it started in the high school and successively we've pushed down the younger and younger ages. So last spring was the first time that I did a middle school. In the meantime, about three years ago, I started coaching the JV team in the high school um, where my kids went because the program had gotten big enough so that they needed to split not only boys and girls, but boys varsity and JV. So oftentimes I'm tasked with having, you know, 30 new kids show up and have never touched a disc before in their lives. So it's always interesting because you have the kids who have come in, whose parents have played, who've always been around the disc, who have been throwing for years, yada, yada, yada. And then you have the kids who are like, my parents want me to play a sport, but I can't play anything else. And this seems cooler than being on a, you know, soccer team where it's hard to get a starting seat. So um, that's where I'm at. And thanks. I really appreciate the fact that you're doing this. And Deidre's back, so she can go now. Hi, everyone. I'm Deirdre. I uh, live Outside of Philadelphia, I coach in the same high school league as Ming, uh, Philadelphia High School Fuel. <laughs> um, I met Strathaven High School in 2014. Um, my son was in elementary school at that time, but myself and my husband uh, were both longtime players and met um, in Italy. He's from Sweden at a tournament. And um, so I just wanted to have a team for him to eventually uh, play on and it just has been an amazing experience growing from a group of about you know 12 or 13 kids to this past year having 60 kids on three teams and early on 
I also work for our school district. I do all of their social media, and um, so I'm kind of have that in and getting everything started. And I run a weekly middle school club at our middle school every Wednesday, and um, and also through our local uh, recreation association, run a program in the fall and spring for grades three through eight um, on Friday evening. So, um, you know, for, I think one of the well, of course, I love Ultimate, but also wanting to kind of build a feeder program um, into our, our high school team and um, just create an Ultimate community where we live in uh, Wallingford and Swarthmore outside of Philly. But one of the challenges that I have is um, you know, just bringing more girls out and also not having enough people to, you know, I know that you need to really make an effort and be intentional about getting um, a building programming for the girls at the middle school age and um, and even in high school. And it took a while for our girls team to really uh, evolve, but just um, doing more to uh, create more programming for girls because we get like 25 to 30 boys out at our middle school club every week. Um, and I really would like to help establish like a middle school league in the Philadelphia area. And like the way other cities have. So anyway, that's that's me. <laughs> I thank you for, so much for organizing this. Who's left? Uh, we have Justin, Strat. Justin and Strat. And Kellen and myself. Okay. I'll go. You said my name first. <laughs> Uh, I'm Justin. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I coach a high school team and um, we've started bringing in eighth graders. Uh, so every year we get a couple of eighth graders who just join the high school practices, but um, we don't really have enough interest to make a whole team. Um, so this past year we kind of decided to bypass all of that and go right down uh, to the beginning of the stream, if you will, the beginning of the source. And we started a third grade Frisbee club, an elementary school Frisbee club. Oh, wow. uh, but that was just about to start when uh, all this COVID stuff happened. So it never came to fruition. So um, I'm here to kind of like bridge the gap between uh, the two things. And, um, you know, is it best to go from middle school or high school and try to go back to middle school or just, you know, start something new at middle school or build it up from elementary? I can go if you're done, Justin. Um, yeah, go I am Strat. I'm the youth director here in the DC area and was the youth director in Portland for a long time. I've coached from elementary um, to college. Most recently, I've coached middle school and, element and an elementary team. Um, at the elementary level, the biggest challenge was attendance and keeping kids engaged, really short attention spans. Um, at the middle school level, I'm agreeing with everyone that both engaging middle school girls and then how to deal with middle school boys, it was one of the most challenging things um, in <laughs> Portland, especially running summer camps mm -hmm. where we'd have one girl um, and then tons of middle school boys who just, they've got, who knows what's going on in that brain, but <laughs> hopefully we can figure it out. <laughs> Kellen, you want to go? Yeah, I can go. Um, I'm Kellen. I am in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I coach mostly high school um, during the fall and spring, and I also coach YCC U20 uh, over the summer. Um, and I am here because I am at one of the one of the few high schools in the area um, that has had some middle schoolers sneaking onto the high school team uh, <laughs> over the past few seasons. Um, so we were actually going to have like half of my girls team was going to be middle schoolers, uh, which is crazy um, <laughs> and awesome. Um, so I think for me, the, the skill levels have been brought up um, by other people, but they also happen for me, not just within the middle school, but also all the way up, like having practices where middle schools and high schoolers are practicing together. Um, I think also with the middle schoolers, I think confidence is another huge area, uh, which yeah probably contributing factor is practicing with high schoolers. <laughs> so, yep. And then Jude, I think that leaves you. Yeah. Um, 
I'm Jude. I'm the youth. I'm the interim executive director at Dis Northwest, uh, and the youth director. I might be the only employee currently right now. Um, <laughs> I'll figure that out. Um, we. I have been coaching for coaching Ultimate for like twenty five years, maybe. Um, I've coached high school, elementary, middle school college and club um i will say that elementary and middle school are my favorite to coach um that doesn't mean they're the not the most challenging um but they they're they're often the most rewarding experiences i have in a season um and uh the for me the the probably the biggest challenge is um and I think a lot of other coaches here address that, that that sort of creating enriching experiences for the more experienced players while bringing up the um, while coaching up the, the bottom part of the roster or the introductory players. Cause I'll have, I have kids on my team currently. Well, that we were, that I was supposed to be coaching that I've been coaching since third grade. Um, they have, you know, they've been playing six years seven years um and then i have kids who just joined and have never thrown a frisbee before so um ensuring that it is a positive experience for all those players so that we get to the end of the season and feel like a team that's that's always a challenge yeah i hear all of you guys uh, i've experienced all of it so um i would say high school here is pretty well established and it's being pushed you know because it's been successful um it's you know, it's being pushed down to middle school programming. Um, and the middle school is, a, is well established in some schools, but not at the school that I coach at. Um, and so I will often have, um, and I'm also not a teacher, uh, which makes recruiting really hard. Um, so I, uh, I often, so I'll have five weeks with the girls in the fall, five weeks with the boys in the fall, and then I'll have uh, 10 weeks on a mixed team. Uh, mixed girls and boys team for the spring um, and it'll, it'll be just me um, so I might have 15 you know this year I only had seven girls last year I had like 20 girls um, and then for the boys I had 30 something last year and 40 something this year all by myself um, so my my challenges are, are maybe maybe more more or less relatable to you depending um, on what your context is it's what the point I was trying to make there. Um, so as far as some of the challenges that got mentioned, some of the challenges that I've experienced is, you know, there's a wide range of skill and experience, right, with middle schoolers. Um, peer pressure is a big factor in that, especially the older kids, they just want to be cool. And, uh, and then um, they're just learning independence. Um, for the sixth grade, at eighth grade, they're trying to exert their independence. So that, that's kind of it I've seen as an issue. Um, there's a lot of pent up energy from sitting all day, especially with sixth grade boys um, who are just have too much energy. Um, and, and, you know, I, I coach them right after school. So that's when I get them uh, and, and it's just crazy. Um, there's also a wide range of social and emotional development as some of you guys pointed out, right? Maturity levels, because it, it, it's just that, that awkward, Kind of development stage, right? Um, between uh, between ten and thirteen, um, it, I've seen um, a lot of self centeredness compared to some of the high schoolers that I teach because um, they don't yet know uh, how to work as a team uh, if they haven't been on teams before, um, etc. And then very commitment, right? Um, so these kids are still being shuttled around by their parents. They have lots of other, like for the first time, there's lots of other after, after school activities going on. So, um, you know, I've had conflicts with school play, school band, cheerleading, that they have to kind of uh, share their time with. Um, yeah, so those are, those are some of the challenges that I found unique um, to, to middle schoolers. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Are other people seeing the gray boxes blocking out things? Oh, yeah. are they? Oh, shoot. 
Okay. Yeah, is that on your screen, Mina? Yeah. Okay, that's why. Okay, is that better? No, they're still there. Oh man, gray boxes like. Okay, yeah, they're gone now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I put up the chat screen so that I could see if anyone chatted, but apparently I can't <laughs> without blocking everything. All right, sorry about that. Um, you can actually move it to the side. I did move it to this. No, side. I mean, it, attach it to the side of your Zoom box. Oh. It's on the, and on my screen, it's on the view options. This is sorry. I should have. Uh, are you are you in full screen mode versus? I, I am in full screen mode. Modes. Yeah. So um, now I'm seeing the boxes again. Yeah. Okay. I'm just gonna delete it. If you guys, instead of chatting, just speak up. <laughs> and if somebody adds something to the chat, if they want, if they are in a place that they need to be quiet and and want to add something, I'll I'll raise my hand and. Okay. That works. Um, so given these challenges, I'm going to talk about um, practice planning um, for middle schoolers. Uh, and then, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the aim of this talk today is how do we plan for practices bearing in mind that there are these unique challenges to middle schoolers. Okay, now it's all changed. Oh, there you go. Okay, so um, I think your practice plan uh, should be guided by your coaching philosophy, um, uh, which should be, and your coaching philosophy should be specific to your coaching context, right? Um, and I think writing it down really helps. I'm not gonna make you write it down today. I think that's a totally different um, exercise, uh, but you should, I think I would, I would highly recommend that you, you take some time to actually write it down. Um, Cause I think it really helps solidify your ideas. Um, what I think we should do today is, is um, think about our season goals, right? Um, because that's gonna inform kind of how we go about um, the rest of the season and go about our practices. Um, so I would say have one to three goals for the season, depending on season length that are ideally measurable. Um, maybe you wanna let some of the um, players set one or, or maybe you wanna let the players as a team set one or two of those goals and ask them, well, what do you want this team to be like? What do you want this team to feel like, for example? Um, and I, I would recommend being intentional about addressing those goals um, at every practice. All right, so, I, so if you can take a minute or two to write down one to three goals for your season and just kind of, and then I'll, uh, oh, this is, then we can um, share them. I'm just gonna leave that gray box on the side. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. All right. Does someone um, want to jump in and share what they've written? Um, I wrote um, have fun, learn a skill, or improve a skill and play a game that looks like ultimate. <laughs> Great. Anybody else? Uh, 
I wrote down um, being able to throw and decide how to throw and who to throw to um, and sort of incorporate everybody else on the field while doing that. Nice. One more? Um, sure, I'll go. Um, I wrote uh, teamwork, which for us looks like eye contact and good throws and actual catches and flow. Um, having fun because that is inherent in the game. And if you're not having fun, something is definitely wrong. Um, and also fitness. We get, we get a lot of kids who have never played a sport before and we want them to feel good about themselves and be able to play a game without being out of breath and you know, feel like they're contributing. Nice. Um, so here, here are the goals that I, I kind of set for myself uh, or for the season for the team. Um, one is to uh, instill team mentality, um, love of the game, and then teach them some ultimate frisbee skills. Um, and that's kind of the order in which I, I prioritize them also. Everybody, I think everyone has their, their unique goals, um, but just so you know kind of where I'm heading in terms of this discussion, um, those are what, what I see as my goals are. Um, and you can take those goals and, and kind of convert them into your coaching philosophy when you're writing to kind of, when you're ready to um, sit down and, and write those. Um, it's useful to have these goals in mind. All right, to head off some of the challenges um, that you know, we talked about earlier, I also like to set guidelines for myself um, to follow at every practice. Um, so, um, and I'll do a lot of um, modeling um, as the kids, uh, the kids that I coach at least don't really like to listen. They like to just play. Um, uh, so uh, I found modeling to be kind of the most effective way to uh, get them to behave the way that I would like them to behave. Um, so one of the rules um, that I set for myself is to check my language. Um, the next rule is to encourage mistakes. Uh, next is to get to know my athletes. Um, help them feel challenged yet competent and be fair and true to my word. All right, so um, as far as checking my language goes, I'll try to use inclusive language. Um, uh, I'll be uh, mindful of my tone, um, especially, because uh, I think uh, middle schoolers pick up on the tone um, a lot. Um, and then uh, help athletes or help the kids understand that the words that they choose um, make a difference to the relationships that they create that way. Um, a lot of times you'll hear middle schoolers use the language like you throw like a girl or that's lame, things like that. So I'll kind of um, try to not only avoid those languages, but when those languages are, are, when I hear them speak that language, kind of correct them in a way of, that's not, um, uh, that's more modeling what they should say, right? So instead of saying, you throw like a girl, um, I don't know, it, tell them to say, uh, or sorry, instead of like, oh, that's a hard one to do right now, um, off the top of my head, uh, that's lame, I'll say, um, uh, you mean that's, you know, not cool or something like that. Um, encouraging mistakes, I think is really important. Because um, a lot of kids learn best from from actually doing something and making the mistake. Um, so uh, I sat in on the PPA um, PPA training earlier this month, and um, they brought up having a mistake ritual, which I think is a great idea. I haven't implemented that yet, but um, I wanted to bring that in as a suggestion. Um, so when someone makes a mistake, have some sort of physical ritual that you do, whether it be shaking off your shoulder. Um, or I don't know, kicking something or whatever, just some sort of uh, mistake, physical mistake ritual. Um, I also think it's important to compliment a good mistake um, uh, to encourage uh, good decision making. Um, incorporate support phrases. Um, so if someone you know makes a throw that that. Um, Incomplete, you know, one suggestion was to say way to make it fly, for example, um, as just a, a, a support phrase um, instead of, a, you know, dwelling on, on the mistake that they made. 
Um, and then encourage players to think about what they can learn from the mistake, right? So um, is there some other uh, rituals or phrases that you guys might think of would be good to use um, with middle schoolers? Um, the one that always pops up for me is that all of my girls say sorry all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and in reality, like I want them to make that throw. It's okay that it wasn't complete. And they always say sorry. So what I did is that anytime they say sorry, they have to jump up in the air like and say, I'm a star. Um, and it gets everyone to laugh and kind of forget that there was a mistake and feel bad about themselves, but they jump up like they are a star um, and they have to say it and it gets everyone laughing and, and it happens, everyone does it because everyone says sorry, um, that it like lightens the mood and then makes people, and lets them forget about that mistake quicker. Um, yeah, that's a great, that's a great suggestion. Um, and you can even have this kind of come up with their own uh, support phrase, um, like their team phrase, like you did. Uh, anyone else have any suggestions? We do. Um... I've always found that like a giving a replacement uh, behavior is really important. So just saying, don't say sorry is never, or whatever, yeah. you know, like, so we do finger guns and say next time. So like, if you turf the disc or you drop it, you just go next time like that at that, whoever, whoever's nearby, it doesn't even matter. Like I've seen our kids do it to the teams they're playing against, you know, like just next time. And that's, it's instead of saying, sorry, it's just like, I'm definitely getting that next time or so. Yeah, and it's no. the finger guns part is really important. <laughs> I think the sillier you can make it, the better for the kids. Like they, they really enjoy it and they will buy into that. Right. So I was coaching a really competitive boys team over the summer and they, um, occasionally they would say sorry and so they came up with the idea of five push-ups because that was their competitiveness and it also made their arms stronger um obviously they didn't do it in the middle of a game but if they said sorry at a practice uh they would they would drop in and give me five and that was completely on their initiative so it was pretty funny yeah all right um real quick i'll add uh sure. <clears throat> we had a couple of kids who got really into like wanting to pull it real far and whenever they pulled it out of bounds um in practice they they we joked around five push-ups but it just became practice that in a game if you pulled it out of bounds kids would just be doing push-ups like during the game which is pretty <laughs> awesome that they just took it upon <laughs> themselves to do it <laughs> it's kind of ironic too right they tell you as coaches don't ever make them do punishment and then they're they're kind of doing it themselves but yeah <laughs> well that's a difference between uh yeah. the player's initiative versus exactly yeah. making that coaching choice yeah all right um the next uh rule i set for myself is to get to know my kids um so i think you know every kid is different needs to be coached a different way, has a different personality. Um, uh, and so there needs to be some a respect for each um, kid's unique needs um, and meet those needs when appropriate. Uh, so, you know, getting to know their names, showing interest in their lives, just kind of the small talk, I think is really important to them. Um, and it really helps head off a lot of um, the challenges, um, especially, um, and, it, and it's especially important in understanding kind of the, be, any behavioral issues you might encounter um, with a kid. Cause you know, it's coming from somewhere. And if you don't know where that is, it's kind of hard to, um, hard to get through it. All right, so what I wanted to put out to you guys is to discuss what are some ways you can get to know your athlete. Um, and I think I had planned to do this as a breakout. Is there, there's what, 10 people? Um, let's say. Well, but that, that 10 includes you and. Me, yeah. Groups of three, Jude? Like three minutes? Whoops. Did the.
Okay, I'm going to make you the host. Okay. Um, Great. And that, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I want to be in the breakout rooms. <laughs> okay. Uh, give me a moment. And then you can do it. Okay, someone's going to have to tell me how to do this. It should, at, at the bottom of your screen... You should see a little thing that says a little thing that says make breakout rooms or breakout rooms. Oh, there we go. Okay. So there's nine, three rooms. Um, yeah. So in your rooms, talk about what are some ways you can get to know your, your athletes, your players. Um, and it doesn't give me, let me do a time. Do I have to manually get out of it? There should there is a advanced setting or additional setting or something like that or more options. Allow well, blah blah blah. Close automatically. Three minutes. That one. Okay. Let's see. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> all right. I'm sending you guys all in. Great. I'm in breakout room two. All right, um, does anyone want to share what their group uh, talked about? Anybody? 
Um, sure, I'll go. I was in a group with Amy and Ming, and we talked about um, standing in a circle and um, doing something that was both active and uh, encourage them to then stand next to different people. Uh, Amy talked about a game called Where a Warm Wind Blows, where you say, when a warm wind blows, I don't know, maybe you can explain it, Amy. <laughs> so I'm not familiar with this one. Oh, no? Amy, explain your warm wind blows game. But you're muted right now. Yep. So it's kind of like um, somebody says a warm wind blows for someone who, who has cats and everyone who has cats comes into the circle and then goes back out to a different place in the circle. And whoever can't go to a different place than they started in is the one left in the middle and they say something else like, I like black jelly beans. And everyone who likes black jelly beans comes in and then goes to a different place in the circle. So it's someone else left in the middle who then says the next thing, like I have a dog and a cat or my parents don't live with me or, you know, I live with two different houses or whatever it is that they, they are willing to share with the group and then everyone else and can share that or not. They can decide if it's not something they want to share, they can stay in the circle. So it gives them a safety net to share what they want to share. Yeah, I've played that game as well. It's great. Um, anybody else? Any other group? I can go. Um, we all had different experiences, but I talked about getting to know elementary schoolers. Um, and I didn't say how, but at the beginning and end of practice, there's like more downtime where you can talk on one-on-one -on -one with kids and, and learn about their hobbies or what other activities they're doing or while they're helping pick up cones or while you're getting to throw one-on-one -on -one with them, they'll just talk about random things. And so I just listen and kind of keep track. Cool. Um, so I still don't know what's going on. Can you guys see the screen or no? Yeah. One other yeah. thing I was going to say, it was just similar to what Strat just said when uh, at the end of our breakout group, I was saying when I really fell in love with our players was when we would drive the big van to a game 45 minutes away and just be a fly on the wall and hear their conversations. And prior to, to coaching the middle schoolers, I didn't have a middle schooler. And I was a little afraid of these kids that I didn't you know, I didn't really remember what it was like to be a middle schooler and groups of them can be intimidating, but just to hear them talk about everyday stuff, I'm like, oh, they're just little kids in bigger bodies. And uh, it was really good to see that side of them. Yeah. Okay, I'm back to sharing. I, I guess it took me out of share screen. Is that what happened? Yeah, so yeah, we don't see your screen anymore. All right, okay. I'm gonna do it that way. Does that work for you guys? Okay. Um, yeah, so there was a, oh man, no, I can't do this. Okay. There was a, um, a not so recent study, but still a survey of um, Olympic level coaches in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and they found that 96% rely on informal chats with the athletes on average of two to three hours of the first few weeks to learn about their athletes. Um, and, and they all stated that was one of the keys to their, their successes. And uh, we're not bringing up, you know, Olympic athletes, but still, I think it's, I think this shows how um, important it is. Uh, um, and so you can ask things like, what would you like me to know about you in the beginning? You can talk with their parents. Um, I'd say make everybody a somebody who feels like they contribute to the team. Um, and that's one of the benefits of, of doing this, as well as kind of learning more about them in case you know, behavioral issues do come up. Um, I was telling uh, my group that like, my girls especially like, uh, we're, we're doing TikTok um, while standing around, you know, between activities and I had no idea what that was. So I had them teach me about TikTok and like, you know, so there, there are opportunities like that um, that present themselves. 
uh, to get to know your, your kids. Right. Um, and then another rule um, I set for myself is to help them feel challenged yet confident. Um, this is the one thing I really struggled with even with adults um, when I first started um, teaching. Uh, I didn't realize how um, demoralizing or how if they don't feel successful, um, demoralizing it gets and it, it makes them withdraw and not become engaged. Um, and I think it's the same with kids, right? So kids are naturally competitive and, and they want to be challenged, right? But they get super, you know, very easily discouraged. Um, so um, one way to deal with this is to redirect your objective towards making good mistakes. Um, and then showing them how, uh, in ways that they can see that they are learning and improving. Right. right. And lastly, um, the last rule I set for myself is to be fair and true to your word. Um, so I think it's important that when you set expectations for the team, you also hold yourself to those expectations and you also um, hold all players equally to those expectations, right? So um, you wanna make it clear that all players have the opportunity to succeed, um, have equal opportunities to, to succeed, um, and they're gonna be held similarly accountable for you know, any misbehavior or mispractices or, or whatever, um, because they will pick up on this <laughs> if you're not. Um, And then I, I think you lose a lot of credibility with your players when you don't. All right. So um, now that I've talked about some of the kind of overarching guidelines I set for myself, um, what are kind of the essentials for a successful practice? Um, these are kind of just lessons that I've learned given uh, how, how challenging it was my first season. Um, one is to just set one or two practice goals. It could be one rule and one skill, for example. Um, next is to have a detailed plan. I, when I first started coaching, I kind of had a rough guideline. I was using the GUM ultimate, you know, uh, GUM uh, middle school curriculum because uh, the girls were the first kind of group I was dealing with, but I did not plan it to a T and, and just it was a disaster. Um, they have short attention spans, um, anytime, especially with the boys, if there's any idle time, it just leads to trouble, right? So you want to keep them busy. Um, so I'd say short transition times, short activities, um, I found like 15 minutes um, for my kids, um, less line standing. So, as, as, you know, if you're running, you don't try to divide them up into groups, uh, so they're not standing in line so much, um, less lecturing and more modeling. Um, and then uh, given that these kids had all sorts of commitments and other kind of uh, attention other places and then they're being shuttled around, I found it really important to have an alternative plan for smaller, num smaller numbers because with middle schoolers, I never knew who was gonna show up to practice. Um, there was, you know, I, I'm not gonna enforce a, you have to be at practice to play games type thing. Um, that's kind of one thing kind of I, I said I wouldn't do. So I had to always have an alternate plan um, for smaller numbers. Um, and then the last thing is to leave room for socialization and silliness, like they're middle schoolers, they want to have fun. And if, if you don't um, allow for that, they're not going to, they're not going to come back. Okay, so um, in terms of the skills uh, that I do teach, the order of skills where I do teach them, um, I, can, I start with spirit of the game. Um, and throwing and catching, I will have a ton of sixth graders come um, and very few eighth graders. Uh, uh, seventh graders is, is, is a mixed bag. Um, so all the sixth graders have never, most of them have never played organized frisbee. Um, they've thrown a frisbee around, but you know, they've never played organized frisbee. So um, I kind of have to start from the beginning uh, with all of them. And I think this, these are all good reminders for the eighth graders also. Um, kind of focusing on their fundamentals, right? Uh, so let's start with spirit of the game, throwing and catching. Um, those are bolded because I, I emphasize those throughout um, my season. Uh, then I move on to pivoting, um, then marking, downfield defense, then stack, 
um, than cutting. And then if I'm lucky, I'll get to four. But most of the time, I, I it's a hard concept. Like I might introduce it, but um, I won't uh, emphasize it too much um, for them. And I think there's plenty in, in kind of the first eight, or sorry, first seven skills to focus on even for the more experienced kids. Right? So there's just lots of, um, lots of details about throwing and marking that, you know, um, you can add on to. For can them. I ask you a question? Sure. Um, one of the things that I, like you have like downfield defense before you get to cutting. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the, one of the challenges that I have is that my, the, the middle schoolers are pretty good at defense. So one of the challenges that I've been having is that when I, I ended up not teaching defense because then they can't throw or cut. And yeah. I was wondering like how that works by when you teach defense first, how their offensive flow works. Cause the people, the ones that I've coached, their defense is pretty good and stifling if you don't yeah. know how to like do the other things. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's unique to whatever your situation is. Um, mm -hmm. It's it just like when I'm uh, playing games and stuff like keep away or whatever, um, I'll introduce defense that way. Um, so that's kind of why it's earlier on well, for me. Uh, and then I'll kind of get into the specific, specifics of stack and cutting. So really, um, I emphasize a lot of touches on the disc in the beginning of the season. Like, in the, um, so that's why downtown defense is up front uh, because I'm playing lots of mini and lots of keep away and that kind of stuff. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Can I add something? Sure. Um, my co-coach, who's also my wife, um, she, one thing that she always says is that like everyone, regardless of their ability to throw, you know, or catch, you can contribute on the field playing defense and it comes pretty naturally. So she really likes to emphasize that early um, because you can get, you can, it gives you more successes to point out and get that engagement early. So that yeah. might be another good reason to, to do it that way. Yeah, I mean, um, I had seven girls this fall and um, only two of them, three of them had ever played before. So I had four brand new players um, and, and I really emphasized defense with those brand new players because their throws obviously in five weeks we're not gonna get you know anywhere near uh, the girls who'd been playing before the three girls have been playing before um and they really latched onto it and and um i think first as first time players like by the end of the season um they really wanted to come back and do it again and play more um so having having those successes i think really helped them um find something great about the season for them you know as new players Anyone else? I'm sure everyone has different, I'm, I'm not saying this is the teaching plan, I'm saying this is the teaching plan that I use um, as a suggestion. So I, sure. I do have a question, um, sure. which is how much time you have in any given session or week to teach these skills? Yeah, so um, I usually have one, two, three, four, five practices before they start a game. Um, and the five practices are maybe an hour and a half. Okay. Um, and I'm always starting from scratch every season, right? Because yeah. I always have a bunch of new players. Yep. Wait, so you don't play at all for the first five games? For the, mean, first, the first five, five practices. So they'll be, yeah, for, for, for the first five practices. And then okay. we'll start games twice a week with a practice once a week. And this is like the the AP the Arlington Public Schools middle school right. um, club season. Um, I just seem to remember some coaching clinic somewhere, and it might have actually been USAU where um, I can't remember who the instructor was, but they said that you know at every practice you should give them some opportunity to play, yeah. even if you know the first time is yeah for sure. A disaster area. Yeah. Yeah, they're not going to learn otherwise. Um, so um, that brings me to kind of a sample practice plan. 
I think that was a good transition there. Um, so I, like, as I mentioned, my kids come right after school. Um, so I'll try to have some sort of warm up game for them um, to, to work off that energy um, and while they're waiting for everybody to get together. Um, and that helps them kind of work off the energy and be ready to focus on whatever I might be teaching them. Um, we try to do a lap, uh, stretching and plyos, uh, energy check-in, um, then throwing in catching, uh, chalk talk, uh, a drill or two, and then I'll always leave at least half an hour for a scrimmage at the end. Um, and I try to get them to focus on what we learned in the drill in that scrimmage. Um, and then for the last maybe five or 10 minutes, I'll put some sort of fun twist on the scrimmage. Um, and then if, if I have time, if the kids haven't all scattered uh, because parents have come, I'll try to do a cheer at the end. Um, that's, always, that's always iffy um, because of when the parents come to pick them up. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, um, I try to incorporate my season goal um, as much as I can in my practice plans, right? So let's take the team lap, for example. Um, and I want you guys to talk about in your breakout rooms, how might you incorporate your season goal and how you structure your team lap. Team lap. All right, so. I'm sorry, I'm not really sure how, what, what you mean by the question. Um, so like my main priority is, is teaching a team mentality, right? Um, so I will kind of make them run their laps a certain way. Oh, okay. Uh, emphasize team mentality. So do you, do you change how they run their lap at each practice? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Okay, why am I not, why is the up top menu not coming up? Um, let's see. I, I think I I think I took the uh, oh, I took it, took it away from you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. um, here, I'll just I'm going to I'm just going to do it right now and you don't have to worry about it. Sorry about that. OK, no worries. She's the only one there, but she's okay with that. And she, and that, and like, that's what she wants, like emotionally, and that's what she wants. So it's kind of like also not just knowing what like my goals are, but what are the players' goals in Ultimate? And maybe for them, the right step is to move up, either play U14 boys or go up at age group, which we talked about. If that might not be the right thing right now because they haven't grown yet. So it might not be beneficial that stay with U14 boys, but having that conversation with the parents and knowing like what their motivation is for playing in our leagues. Yeah, yeah, that that totally circles back to the, the point I made earlier of getting to know your players and, um, you know, understanding why they wanna be there is, is, is I think important and part of that. Um, I've had the luxury of having smaller groups of girls and um, where I could give more individual attention um, and give more direction um, to, to the more experienced players while, um, you know, trying to teach um, the less experienced or the brand new players and having them help me teach the brand new players. Um, but I know that's not always a, well, I call it a luxury because um, teaching 40 boys is, is, is a nightmare. Um, but uh, yeah, I know uh, some, some, some programs have more, uh, some people don't have that bandwidth to, to deal with the numbers and, and have too many numbers. Um, so I think that's a good suggestion is to kind of figure out ways to address both um, by offering different, different opportunities for them. Um, 
Okay, so I want to be mindful of time here. We really only have two minutes left. Um, so uh, the next thing is uh, how to teach team mentality. Um, these are kind of a few suggestions that I have. Um, the one important thing is having them learn each other's names. A lot of the times eighth graders won't know the sixth graders names and at the end of the season still won't know it until, unless you're intentional about having them always say names. Um, and that really, I think, ties the, the team mentality together. Um, play lots of small ball, as I mentioned, highlight good things other teammates are doing. Um, Re-incentivize sharing the disc. I think uh, Joy brought up, um, you know, uh, you get, a, you know, during a, a scrimmage, um, having them make sure that they pass to everybody before they score. I think is that that the example that you brought up. Um, you can always, um, you can also make the point system um, based on how much they're sharing the disc, right? So now the scores aren't based on actual points, but like you get two points if everyone's touched the disc, for example, instead of one, when you score. Um, have the team decide on uh, a mistake uh, ritual or support phrase um, that everybody uh, uses and buys into, um, and then acknowledge good uh, team be, um, good team mentality. All right, and you're always going to have those disruptors on, on a on a middle school team, um, especially. Um, so, what can you do to deal with them? Um, as I mentioned earlier, get to know them and what's going on in their lives. That, that might help you kind of understand um, where they're coming from. Um, give them a role on, on the team uh, to make them feel like they are uh, useful. Um, someone suggested once to put them on the spot um, and and uh, let them get out whatever they want to they want to get uh, attention for. Um, another one suggested ignore, but don't let them know um, that you're noticed. Um, you can have the team develop rules and consequences um, for disruptors. Um, you can try to head it off with a purposeful and full practice plan, um, and then just reinforcing uh, desired behavior. Um, does anyone want to share any, anything that they've found successful um, in dealing with disruptors? I really think this is highly dependent on the actual kid um, and why they're doing it. And, and uh, so it's kind of hard to come up with a with one bullet, silver bullet on how to, how to do this. I've actually taken disruptors and tried to pair them with people who don't know that much so that put them in a position where they have to teach somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, that's one way, to, a good way to deal. I, I've learned a lot. I mean, there are some just structural stuff, you know, like, Going and if it's somebody who just, for whatever reason, it's, you know, habituated, I'll just kind of make sure if we're circling up, I'm standing next to that person, right? Just my presence will, will help dissuade some of that. But I also, I, I've learned a lot from exploring trauma-informed coaching, the theories behind trauma-informed coaching. And so mm. it allows you to sort of, it asks you to sort of re- uh, reframe the idea of them being disruptors and kind of meet them where they are and, 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 and allows you to sort of like reevaluate where they're coming from, what that disruption is a, is a manifestation of. Um, so I, yeah, definitely encourage folks to look at, look at some of the information and training around trauma informed coaching and teaching there. Um, it's, it's really it's, it's really changed the way I coach over the last 10 years. Yeah, I'll have to look into that. Sounds like a good, good road to take. Um, anyone else? Um, so, so something that I, I, I try to remember, which maybe is part of what you were saying is um, that um, so I, I worked at a camp for many, many summers and, and the campers, you really have no idea what's going on in their lives, what's going on at home or at school or, you know, developmentally, um, but that while they're at ultimate practice, um, it should be the highlight of their day. And um, we don't know how much they're looking forward to it or not looking forward to it, but we can only control the time that we have with the kids and 
uh, just make it the best experience that it can be. Um, and, and keeping in mind, especially middle schoolers who are going through all the issues of adolescence, um, that they might not be able to help it. And um, I joke when I say that their medication might be wearing off. That, you know, um, it's that awkward time between the end of school and going back home um, that is very transitional for some kids, unfortunately, more than others these days. And uh, to just keep that in mind and, and be gentle and be kind and keep it fun and um, make it the best experience that it can be for them. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a, a really good, important thing to keep in mind. Um, and you can head off a lot of behaviors that way also. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, know, I know we're past our time now. <laughs> um, so I know some people brought up low numbers, especially with girls. Um, I, I think the best recruiting is actually having the other players go out and recruit for you with girls, um, bring their friends in, um, just have them bring friends who've never played frisbee before and just, you know, have them try it out. Um, having older brothers bring in their little sisters is also another good way to recruit girls um, that I found. Like a lot of the sixth grade girls that I have coming in, their older brothers have played um, and they want to be just like them. You know, and uh, that's, that's another another way to do it. Um, some ideas for, you know, things you could do with low numbers is play mini, keep away, stick, gut, pot box, make it or take it, uh, double disc court. Um, and then some drills, good drills are kill drills. Um, I've used cups even um, to have them focus on their uh, accuracy and throwing. Um, I got two like lawn sticks. Uh, and then I put cups on the end of them and have them throw to it. Um, flutter guts is another game that the kids tend to like, um, you know, practicing their hand-eye coordination. Um, Three-person marking drill, 1v1 uh, drills, um, can jam, or having them design their own disc golf um, course and playing disc golf around um, the field. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any other suggestions, uh, I mean, this kind of ends it for me. Um, Feel free to stick around and talk. Um, some resources I used are Maddie Sang's YouTube videos, the GUM Middle School Curriculum, um, the Australia Disc um, Association Teaching Teacher Resources document, um, and then some of the stuff that Strat and I put together for our um, CDP uh, facilitator workshop. Um, so those are some some resources that you can go to. Does anyone have any final thoughts? I know it was well, rushed in the end. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you because uh, for me, it's helpful to know that we're not alone and that our middle schooler are just like every other middle schooler around the country and that um, we're all having to deal with the same same issues. So it's just, it's nice to, to have a support group of middle school coaches. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, now you guys have all met each other and you can, and you know what everyone's uh, coaching context is. So if you have yep. a specific question, you can go to them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And that's you. what these things are great for. Yep. Yeah, thank you for putting this together. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that right. was great. That was great. Um, I'm definitely going to make that like standard issue for all incoming coaches in our league. <laughs> and, Good, and, I'm glad it was useful. Yeah, no, I think a lot of folks who take on coaching um, who've never done it before that the structure part is the part that's in intimidating. Like, well, how do I even think about it? How do, if you've never done it, how do you even yeah. begin to, to structure that stuff? So you, you, it's there, you created a great outline that people can kind of make their own. It's awesome. It's really good. Yeah. And uh, like I said, I'm no expert. I kind of drew on, I'm the, I'm the, the digester of all the resources. So, um, you know, I had a, learn really quickly because uh, I just jumped in and, and did it without thinking that, oh, how hard can this be, right? Um, and it's, it's quite different quite from different. coaching, you know, college or college students or even elementary school kids, right? So, yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Thank well, you thank you guys much. all for coming and participating. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. All Thanks, right. Mina. Bye. Nice Bye. to see you. Bye. Uh, I, I put, if anybody's interested in the trauma informed coaching thing, I put a link to oh, kind yeah. of a little clearing yeah. of this thing in the chat. Check it out.
that we we coach does a really good training uh, on it, and I know that Positive Coaching Alliance is putting together a training about it. So, all right, cool. Thanks a lot, Jed. Thank you all. Stay you safe. Too. Wash your Are hands. You? <laughs> uh, join us tomorrow. Collins, is that tomorrow? Wait, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. It's tomorrow. All right. Yes. No, it's tomorrow. Uh, yeah, it's hard to keep track of days when <laughs> time and dates don't matter anymore. Uh, but I know yeah. it is tomorrow because it means I have to finish the presentation okay. today. <laughs> Sorry. Deep breath. It'll be great. That's fine. Awesome. Yeah, join us tomorrow at 10. Great. All Take right. care, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks.